it's a chore and I can't do it out. Yeah. Okay. Apologize for being late. It's all right, no problem. Mm -hmm. We're here. Let's call the meeting to order. The date is September 10th, 2012. <clears throat> the time is 6.37 p.m. Gary Ciccaroni. Here. Rick Charette. Present. Mike Michalski. Here. Ed Nason. Jim Freeman. Here. Rob Collins. Here. Clifton Camp. Ed Camo. Here. Missing, and of course the uh, the official, which we cannot replace. Ed, will you will you be <clears throat> Ed Nason tonight? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, just briefly, the only uh, mail we have is uh, a municipal law lecture series um, offered by. Um, uh, the local government center, LGC, and pre-registration is required. It costs twenty-five dollars per lecture. There are three different lectures concerning presidential basics for planning and zoning board procedural. Excuse me, religion and land use controls. What are the legal limits? Now that's an interesting, interesting one. Land use controls. <laughs> Innovative land use controls, re-examining your zoning ordinance. Those are the three uh, things that are given by the attorneys at the uh, law center. So if anyone would like to partake, it's a $25 fee per lecture. And we'll leave this right up here and you can get that information and we can send it in later. So we will have, uh, open the floor now to public comments if there are any. Um, not you at this moment. Okay. Caused too much trouble. Yeah. <laughs> we have a, we have allocated a spot for you. So, uh, hearing no public comments from anyone on the floor, we'll go on to review um, for the minutes from August thirteenth, two thousand and twelve, and we'll go for that right now. Everybody finished with the review? Do I hear a motion to accept the minutes? Motion to accept. Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Opposed? Abstinence? Then the meetings go into the book. They are approved for the minutes. Thank you. Well, welcome back, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> How about Bob? 
instead of me explaining what you've already told me, why don't you uh, yeah. explain to the board? The plan board tonight about is, is that uh, um, we're thinking of putting a, a disc golf course in up to the mound. And uh, I don't know if everyone knows what disc golf is, but basically it's golf that's played with a frisbee. You can have 18 holes or proposing 18 holes. Um, you know, I visited a few in the area and it's kind of a nice scenario with these baskets you shoot them into so it seems like a real nice use for the for the land kind of almost like a hiking uh, adventure type thing uh, uh, kind of low use uh, you know we've had a site review for the tubing park and, and I anticipate the usage in terms of people at any one time would be considerably less than, than the, the tubing that we're going up to now the winter this will give us a summer type of activity so it's a permitted use under your new new regs that we just approved you know the, the recreation committee put a a use in there and disc golf is a, a listed permitted use um, so when I'm kind of before the board on an informal nature and I won't expect you to to make any decisions tonight but just so you can all be thinking about it as members um, in terms of a site review, I, I would look for the board for some kind of input as to what you're going to be looking for from me. I mean, we've dealt with parking, we've dealt with public bathrooms, we've dealt with the lodge. I mean, we've dealt with all the issues. Are we going to rehash all of them again? Or, you know, again, I'll just be looking for something. I got a question for you. Yeah. Are you going to build any buildings? No. Are you going to alter any water courses? Are you going to add any water hazards? No. Is it going to be open in the winter for cross country skiing? Uh, absolutely, yeah. A lot of this golf stay open 12 months a year because we're actually, uh, our 18th hole is going to be right from where you to now, right down the fairway. So, I mean, we can't run the two meeting this at the same time. So, Okay. This will be open when the tubing shut down and when the, we have to fire up the snow leaking into the tubing, the disc golf will end until spring again. Anybody got questions? Go ahead. Just for the record, could you state your name and who you represent? Just for um, Bob Bordeaux. Yeah, you're very good. Uh, I'm curious, a couple, I've got a couple questions. Um, one is, are you intending that this would be built in, a, in an accessible way for like, uh, uh, you know, in the ADA sort of standard idea where you need paved pathways or no. is this really, this is going to be low impact. So it's going to be, you got to walk. Right. If, if, you know, I've visited a few and if you visited one, I mean, it can be strictly a wooded path. The trees are still there. They're shooting around the trees. I mean, we, we plan to have some open holes, you know, around the lodge. We hope plan to put a hole in each one of the fields, one to the left of the driveway when you come in and one to the right. And, and there'll be, so there'll be like four or five open, no, 18 is going to be right down the fairway, which is all open, but beyond that, everything else will be just hiking trails in the woods. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify by holes, you mean uh, baskets, not baskets. actually diggering and altering the, the baskets. Right. Just, just to clarify. Five foot craters. Yeah, five foot craters, exactly. <laughs> so if I recall correctly, the site plan review that we all suffered through um, was restricted to a very limited portion of your property. Yes. Um, is the disc golf is the proposed disc golf restricted to the portion that we focused on, or would you be needing to sort of bring in additional it, it, land into know, the site I plan. I mean, everything we dealt with, it's, it's, it's kind of there. It, you know, if anything, we're going into the woods um, a little more easterly, uh, but we're not going any higher. Because I put the thing in current use, and, and I kept everything from where my tubing is down, active. And we're not moving that. The highest hole anyone has to walk to is the elevation of the of the tubing. We're not going any higher in the mountain. Everything's staying kind of in the lower level, 
just sliding maybe a little bit east into the woods, kind of. You know, we're trying to use the existing slope trails, and we're trying to use the existing snow machine trails that run through there. There's some logging roads. We had to cut three or four fresh cuts, but most of it we're using the existing terrain. So you're just going to plant posts, 18 posts for the holes, put the baskets up on yeah, top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just cement them in the ground, and, and uh, they're kind of unique baskets. They're about this big around, and, and then they have a small ring, and they have chains that hang, and when you fly your disc, it hits a chain, and drops in the basket. Is there, is, there one, is there something like that around here? This will be about the sixth or seventh one in the state. Really? I see one in Ainsbury, Massachusetts, yeah, at yeah, one, of, yeah. one of the parks. Yeah, they got one up in Ossipi, uh, they got one in Dover, those are the two closest to here. Yeah. Um, but we'll be either the sixth or seventh one in the state. Go ahead. I've never played it, try it, it's a lot of fun. So, are you uh, going to be adding some retail space related to this? Selling discs and other paraphernalia? Yes, you will. In your existing buildings? In the existing buildings, yeah. So that we don't go through the painful experience that we all went through last time, I would ask you to do this for us. Describe the things. This is preliminary, and I would have had you do this for tonight, but I, I didn't really. I had a conference with Laura Spector over this. Very minor, but just because we don't need a lawsuit, and we're probably not going to get one, but nonetheless. <laughs> um, why don't you submit a description of this in writing, of what you intend to do? And if you can, on a loose leaf sized nine by 11 and a half paper, the map of the mountain, and just circle the area that you're going to use for this. Yeah. Very simple. And if you can get it to us before the next meeting, we'll have it on the table at the next meeting. Okay. And that would be appreciated, and then we'll be able to... I'm open for next spring, and again, I yep. just wanted to... I didn't expect any answers or anything. I just wanted to throw it out at you, so maybe you go online and look at some other sites, and maybe some questions will come up, and, and I just wanted to see how you guys want to go about it. If you can give us that description of it, of what you what the intent is and I mean you don't have to get into a site plan you know just something that it exists to show us what you're going to do on the mountain and we'll take it from there and I don't I don't see any trouble for us in reviewing this so and rather quickly it's not a complicated thing so we'll see if you would do that we'd be <coughs> willing to receive that from you anytime and, and Yes, we will go that Just way. If we have that information and we can uh, see exactly what you're doing. I would like to get this before the meeting, though. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And, and not just the day before. If you can give me uh, a, a little bit more time. Uh, it, uh, I get a, a, most yeah, a couple of weeks. Okay, that would be great. Yep. Well, thank you, Bob. Okay, appreciate it. You're welcome to stay for the appreciate rest of the uh, hour if you want. But, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this place has probably got a lot of good memories. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, oh. I'm going to try that if he opens it up. I need the extra. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Okay. We're into old business now. Um, if the board would excuse me for one minute. I'd like to make a phone call. I left. Let's see if we're going to need it first, Mary Lou. We're going to go into CIP here. And you're here. And obviously, Brad is not here tonight. So we're not going to deal with roads until some representatives of the road committee are here. But you are here. and We can talk about this. Do you have with you the copy of what the architects? Yeah, I do. Okay, because I have his copy at home. And I left it on the hutch. And I would have my son drop it off to me. No, I'm it. Hmm? 
No, okay. So let's. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind taking a look at it if you would. Thank you. Appreciate that. And most of the information is in the um, recommendations. Yeah, oh no, I, I looked, I've reviewed it, but I just haven't quite committed it to memory yet. You know? The architecture proposal? Yep. It's called a site. Well, we're, we're talking about putting together CIP. Um, Rob emailed me some things from particular towns, and one of them, I went through a bunch of them, and one of them, I, I didn't copy them. Um, at some point, we're going to all have to take a look at some things from towns of similar size and stature of Brookfield. To get an idea of what they've got in their CIP reports, because looking at the one for Rochester is hardly helpful, because they have to acquire an awful lot more data and an awful lot of more complicated systems for CIP than we'll ever need. So, but Pittsfield happened to be one that's commensurate with our size and stature, and there's a couple others in the state. I didn't make copies of them. Um, I have been very busy lately and I'm not as freed up as I thought. But I think uh, I would like to ask Mary Lou how the Heritage Commission feels about this report in terms of implementing some of the things in here. Okay. Have you guys discussed it? Yes, we've discussed it. I figured. <laughs> we, um, I will um, indicate to you that the, it has also been discussed at the selectmen meeting level and mm -hmm. one of the items in fact the first recommended item was to kind of show i'm not going to use the right words because i'm not in construction yeah wing, wing it it's okay so we'll get it is to fix or shore up the floor underneath the schoolhouse mm -hmm. and so the plan is at this point that once I get through a couple more, we have a site survey um, the 22nd of September, and once we get through that, that we will try to write up an RFP to put out for proposal the, that repair work. I do think the estimate there is high. Terry and the echo in here. I think the estimate that was given to us okay. by the architect is high. Um, we have received one bid already, and um, but need to put it out. To be fair, for just the floor. For just the floor in the schoolhouse. In the schoolhouse. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's where we're at at this point. I think what we will also do in conjunction with the CIP is for the Heritage Commission to come up with like a going through the recommendations, come up with a list of projects to be scheduled over the next few years. Um, and I walked around the building a little while ago. I noticed that this back corner of the townhouse could use some paint or attention or whatever. So we will be looking at those and trying to provide the budget committee with proposals for that work that we need to be done. <coughs> okay, now this is the price that you've got is implementing this the way the architect has. The way the architect, not necessarily what we will end up paying, I'm sure. Yeah, well, you're going to get pricey. And remember, we there. also need to remember that um, last year some of the work was done. Um, so the work, there's a charming picture in there of an electrical issue in the attic. <coughs> here. The electrical here in the kitchen was upgraded some, but we still have electrical work to do because we still have a piece of electrical tape 
on our trip. <laughs> so there's still work to do, but um, some of it has been started. What else did we do? There was something. Oh, we, we blew insulation into the attic to bring it up to date. The attic where? Here. Here, in the townhouse. And then there was a, a big rate put up over the call space. Yeah, between the two buildings. Yeah. Um, Jim, you got a question? Yes. Go for I was wondering, uh, do you have a detailed list of uh, work that has been done so we can have a general picture of what how that Absolutely. reflects against this? Sure, uh, but project? I can provide you with, I'm a princess. I used to be a queen. Well, I'm still a queen of spreadsheets. So I'll give you a spreadsheet that list takes the recommendations from the report and indicates what the work has been done already. Yeah, that would definitely be very helpful as far as going over the information from. I have to read this a little more thoroughly, but have they addressed the plaster situation or at all? They, they, Not to my satisfaction. Well, if you insulate it, you might put the plaster uh, I'm looking for the right word. The plaster bonding out of reach. And you might exacerbate the damage that will occur from adding insulation up there. Because insulation, by its nature, collects and retains moisture unless it's closed cell. And what they're asking for is not closed cell. So, And those places generally are subject to humidity and Temperature change is extreme from roof surface to warm room below, which creates condensate in insulation on the back side of the plaster. And before any, I would recommend anybody do insulating up there, I recommend they secure the plaster. It's already done. It's huh? Already done. The insulation's already done. And we've gone through it was done last. Uh, not a new insulation. Added. You're talking about adding more? No. Oh, okay. just leaving what's up there. I know. No, what. no. More they've, already, they've already added the insulation to the attic. When? They last, did that fall. last fall. So we've already gone through one winter with the new insulation, but it wasn't going Okay. Well, so but a vapor barrier was put I don't want to get into the technical aspects of this because it's not our function here as a planning board anyway. And the vapor barrier was put underneath the schoolhouse. Yeah, that's the b b first thing before the floor joist, you want to? Right. Yeah. Um, our function here isn't to determine what work should be done. I think just priorities that for doing the work. Does, does the architecture's report include what needs to be done and, and, and prioritize? Yes. Well, I don't know. I didn't find it all that particularly good. But what can I say? I mean, it's all right. You know, that's on that's on the website, right? Yep. It is on the website. Yeah. It takes a long time to download. It's a huge. For instance, the, the plaster really should have been dealt with before insulation was installed, but it isn't. It's too late, and those are technical issues that I have some knowledge of. So, but it's at this point it's it's moot. So there's no sense in even discussing that. But the but it is going to affect the the plaster as I said it would affect it. It's inevitable. And th there's not a chance that it won't do that. And it should be in this report, but it isn't. So I would suggest that the plaster issue be addressed. Not 40 years from now, you know? Um, that's just a suggestion. That should be part of CIP. Oh, I agree. I agree, but I think for us to do, to address the plaster correctly, um, is going to be one of the biggest issues of this building. Yeah, I would venture to say that's true. Although the foundation... We, I mean, we know we have this issue here with water still somehow at some point having come in and... and yeah, but no longer. It's not still doing that. Right. Yeah, because we did the roof on this some t t t 10, 12 years ago. And they put the ice and water shield on the eaves. 
and that stop that's what was going on out there you know so I don't think that'll happen again but it's falling down in places and yes there are remedies for this and it, it's but I will tell you that the Heritage Commission feels very strongly that we have purchased books and I don't have one with me on how um, historic renovations are to be done and would really feel and suggest strongly that the selectmen in the town follow the regulations that are set down by the federal government on the repair of this building since it is on the Federal Registry of Historic Places. You mean methodology? Yeah. Technique? But do, but that's usually governed by the nature of the repairs that need to be done. Right. But there are also guidelines yeah. on federal websites that... Well, I'd be interested in seeing them. Um, this is in pretty good shape. This is in pretty good shape. No, I agree. But right. Overall, I mean, For it's... its age. It's not, and right, it's not going to go another 50 years, though. It'll be, it'll be falling down. Right. No, we know that. I know you do. <laughs> so that's... You know, and that's a lot of the reason that we requested that the town do the survey was so that we could start planning to preserve this building. It's been here, we've had all our town meetings here for over, you know, a hundred and something years and we want to see it preserved. Well, this is really simple to save. It's just labor intensive. Right. It's handwork, but it is simple. It's not complicated. It depends on the level of preservation you want to do. You know, it needs to be painted and stenciled and... Right. That was done last in 1975 for the Bicentennial, was mm -hmm. what I think happened. Yes. Done. Right. But the moment you start doing repairs, we're going to repair it again. So this isn't... The actual paint job isn't from the 1800s. No, no, no. No, in fact, if you look um, back in this corner, You can see that there's like a brick red back here. Yep. So that was probably one of its, could have been one of its previous lives. <laughs> this canceling, my understanding, was done by a uh, son of, oh, I can't remember her name. The woman who, a woman who lives in Wakefield, who, Olivia, Yeah, it's, it's, even, but the painting is, is one issue, and that's one entity in itself. But then the, the, the structuring of the plaster to stay on the lath. Right. You read that thing I wrote for Ernie. Yes, I did. And there are, we've done this, I've done it. There's methods to that that are tried and true that they use for exactly this application. With that glue that's injected behind the plaster in between the lath because the plaster keys break you know up behind the lath so what they do is they drill small holes and you buy a tool and it injects an epoxy compound behind the plaster which glues the plaster to the lath and it's virtually indestructible it'll never come apart then and if it's very cracked up and alligator cracked and you want to save the plaster, they have a fiber mesh product that you embed in a roll-on compound, which is all very inexpensive materials, just labor intensive. None of this stuff costs much. But if you have to drill 5,000 holes, you're on scaffolding for a month, squishing, squirting epoxy in there. The alternative is to go out and redo. So that is expensive. And nobody wants to do that. But then if the plaster were in worse shape, then you put the fiber mesh on and then skim coat and paint the new stencils. And then this plaster stays up forever. But I will tell you that I'm not sure. Well, so, you know, I, I think we're all on the same page. We want the building restored and and we want to see it preserved for future generations. Mm -hmm. And we all have the same objective. So um, for now, why don't I get you a spreadsheet that 
says what work's been done and what their recommendations are so that each member of the committee can have that. So are there any members on the CIP committee who are not on the planning board? It was decided not to yet. handle as a board. Pardon me? It was decided to handle the CIP as a board. As a board. Okay. Would you, would we, would <coughs> you would consent to be on the CIP committee as far as the buildings go, wouldn't you? What I Do you have the time? <laughs> no, but I still would do it. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm saying to you is that we're obviously not going to go running into this. We have to prioritize things and make recommendations. That's, that's the deal. So if we're going to do that, then we have to pick items that are doable. If, if all of them go on a list, they're going to go on over a period of time. So we prioritize them. The plaster that's falling down in many locations, that might be subject to being epoxied immediately or not too far in the future to stop that. Like, for example, there's a couple, there's some real bad spots. That needs to be fixed. And it needs to be fixed. And over there by the trap door, et cetera. Yeah, they need to be done before they collapse. Well, those are, you mean the crack? That's when they restructure the foundation, that problem. That can be repaired with elastomeric sealants and caulks, but I'm just saying that, do you, how do you feel about putting as a top priority, taking care of those places where the plaster is about to fall off the ceiling? You know what, I don't think that would be the highest priority for the Heritage Commission, I think. Yeah, and I think um, when the selectmen looked at the budget, it could be possible to do that this year um, with this year's budget. What price did you get? Pardon me? What was the price you got? No, no, I don't tell you the price. Oh, you can't do that. Well, I'm not bidding. That wasn't the issue. But, <laughs> no, but if, she, if she somehow managed to get a bid before it was put out to bid. The bids are not all, not all in? Is that no, 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 no. I haven't even done up the RFP yet. Oh, oh okay. So, I misunderstood. I beg so your pardon. I'm not Okay. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I think that the Heritage Commission should provide us with their capital projects. And I don't think that we should be discussing uh, changing, approving, disapproving of those of that list. I think that if you, you clearly have, you care about this building and you have knowledge that could be helpful, my suggestion would be that you don't apply that as chairman of the planning board, but you go to their, go work with them as part of the Heritage Commission to make sure that we have the best minds that we've got on what that plan is. But, you? but our, our role, I believe, if from, from the reading I've done on CIP, our role in the CIP is to get the input from the different groups. I understand that. Let, me, let me cut you short. Get it to the I get the point. To get to the Notice what I asked her were questions, not, not what questions on what would be her suggestion and what our priority list should be. Well, I think that that is probably one of them. And, and, and really, that's what I want from them, what their suggestion of a priority list is. And that's how we'll enter it into the CIP. I think maybe I, maybe you misunderstood me. I think that the planning board shouldn't does not need to be asking those kinds of questions or trying to cr t trying to help them create their list unless they really need our help i think that the heritage commission probably has this this building well under control in terms of what needs to be done and they i imagine the main focus of your group right now is figuring out what the plan for this building should be right yes. and i think that that's what they should be. That's what they should be doing, and we should be letting them do that. No, I think it's a concert. Everybody does this. Not think the planning board with the heritage commission simply for the reason that they're not. They're setting up a priority list, and they're basing everything upon this. And I don't blame them because this is the only thing they have. We're also taking into consideration their report as well. It's not the only thing. I, I didn't hear that. Take, We're also taking into consideration the report you submitted as well. Okay, no, I'm, that's not, not what I, that's not what I meant. This is not the only document we've received, so, you know, we need to gather all the information and we need to make the decisions from now. Mm -hmm. set, your set your priority list and submit it to us and we'll...
put it in CIP. And the selectmen are evidently the deciding body to this. I they presume. Are the deciding body. Yeah. Well, we well that's what I figured. So what you're saying is that we sit here and the Heritage Commission gives us the priority list and how the buildings are dealt with and we just lay it on the, on the uh, CIP and that's that. Uh, that's my understanding because... It, we, we, I don't think that's the way it works. We'll, we'll never get this done if we go down into the weeds on every little thing, even a town this small. The, the road, so the road committee, they have their plan for the roads. They're, they give it to the selectmen. Yep. We should reflect that in the CIP the way that they present it. Heritage Commission reports to the selectmen as well. We should be reflecting their capital projects in the CIP as they're presenting them. And there's going to be other areas where there is not a committee and we're going to have to dive down into the weeds. I don't know, maybe the cemeteries we're going to have to do more work on, you know, and, and develop the list ourselves. But I think that the big ones, we've already got groups of people who are focused on them. We're never going to get this done if we have to come up with all the answers at this board in these meetings, right? So the other one would be Rob, the town offices, because we, as the Heritage Commission, really won't focus right. on those. Right, and so I think that we should be focused, we should be working with the committees and commissions that already exist that can help, that can provide input, that will have capital projects. Well, and, yeah, well, and that's I, what we're doing here, aren't we? We'll I think the point, my point is that we don't have, we spent, I don't know what, the last half hour talking about plaster, and that's not the job that we need to be doing for the CIP. They need to be talking plaster for for days, not not just half an hour, right? That's my point. Okay, okay. Point well taken, thank you. How would you like to proceed here? So, I would like for the Heritage Commission over the next couple of months to work on, you know, our projects. I definitely will have a list back to you of the priorities as we see them and um, what work has been done already at the next meeting. And I think we go from there if we can get an RFP out to get that floor repaired before winter. Cool. You, you, have, you haven't actually put it out to bid, but you no, have No, we have not. Okay. No, there has to be all the official notices and all that. Right. So, no, we have not put it out. Are you, I have a question, a quick one. Yeah. Are you going to do something with the walls too with, when the floor gets done? To keep them so, from going outward or? Yes, there's some question on why they're buckling and yes, the walls definitely are a consideration because it's very obvious if you stand outside in the back especially that the walls are buckling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it needs to be taken into consideration. Well, because I don't want to put this off the record, it might combine the two, but you don't have to hire them out as jointly, but you can see if the price works better for the two of them being done simultaneously. More work is often less money in this, that respect. But anyway, okay. Well, are you going to present that to us at a certain point in time? So, I certainly don't mind coming up with the list of the projects and what's been done already at your next meeting. Is there an anticipated date that you have for the end of the CIP project? There is no such thing. It's a, okay. it's a, CIP is so ongoing. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's my thought. It's so a live, if living we, committee. If we continue to work over the winter and, and on for the next little bit, I would assume we'll be, Heritage Commission will be working on it. You'll be working on it, and we'll go from there. I don't see a deadline unless you're no. I thumbed through Wolfboro CIP. I was down in their town hall last week and I thumbed through it. And the way they've approached it is, of course, they got a much bigger infrastructure, the city water, sewer, everything, lots of, lots of different things they have to consider. And what they do is they, and it seems make, to make sense because it creates a record and leaves it for anybody to see. You submit a list of priorities. It gets dealt with. And it stays in the book, although it may be in a volume for the previous year, with the action, the resolution, etc., the cost, the whole nine yards, any action was taken by the town, and then that's closed to the next priority that was dealt with financially in the same fashion. And they have everything that they've done there for review, they don't... Right. 
you know, it, it wasn't a bad way because it was really, really self-explanatory. It was pretty simple to see what they'd been doing. That was their CIP. I, I liked it, but nothing that complicated here. Right. So I don't think it has to be complicated. I've looked at some from other towns, and you know, they don't seem complicated. We just need to get the information among all of us. So the first step to setting up ours is compiling all that information, getting the. Yep. The list, the priority list from the Heritage Commission, and we submit that to the plan. Put it on record. Becomes part of it, yeah. And I think, obviously, in my mind, there could be amendments along the way. You know, if we suddenly, obviously, if something happens, sure. we have an emergency or something like that. Yeah, it gets put in, it's put in the plan, in that category yeah. that it belongs in. Well, that's how Wolfboro does it, and I liked it because it's very simple to understand. It's nothing complicated. Yeah. Some of their flow charts aren't the greatest, but then again, we're not worrying about municipal electric, city water, and sewer too much in the near future here. Excuse the pun, flow chart. But. So we got this built, this set of buildings, and a few roads. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Cemeteries. Cemeteries, Cemeteries. yeah. Cemeteries. No beach. No parks. Hmm? Okay, well, we're not going to, we'll let you, whenever you do that, we're here for the year. We're going to set up a format, and that's what I want to discuss with the board. I have a bunch of them, and they, they vary a little bit from one to the other. We have to pick a format, set it up, and then insert the stuff from yeah. various agencies or what have you. So. Okay. That's our next job. Okay, so I will attend your next meeting. I'll bring the list of the priorities from the Heritage Commission. Okay. And then we will also give you a, a list of what's been done on some of those. The only issue I would see is that on some of the recommendations from the architect, the, um, we did pieces of it. So we didn't necessarily finish the whole recommendation. But I'll let you know what we did do. That's part as of a priority as, list, right? As far as the guideline to present to the selectmen, we should, if there's something that's been piecework repaired, yeah. you may want to consider that as an entire repair because it may fall into other parts that will have to be replaced. But make sure that it's correct the first time because we want to make sure to do spend the money wisely and get the most bang for our buck to make Absolutely. this uh, make this building you know sustainable for many, many years to come. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yep. So, um, Gary or George, could you send to me what you decide on as your final format? Just like We're not going to decide on a format tonight. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to have to look at it. In fact, <clears throat> because you're a portion of this and you're a member of the public and you're interested, the board would welcome your input. Anyway, on that, we're going to have to decide in a format. That's what we, how we do that. Okay. There's several we can use, and it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel. It's been invented a dozen times elsewhere. So we're going to pick and choose from among them, and everybody's going to look at it. And your comments are welcome. Thank you. Cool. I Thanks. think the, the other piece of the CIP that we're going to have to pull together, which you might be able to help us with, is just the... Uh, random assets we've got around computers and office equipment right so treasurer i'm sure could give us a list i assume that you're the one who's tracking who at least has them somewhere in a spreadsheet that this asset tag is on this thing right and maybe yes. when it was bought sort of we don't have asset tags per se and remember the building was built and finished in 2000 as i recall and um but i do have a list of all the equipment that we have and so we'll need someone maybe from the various departments that work here to give us an idea of when they're going to need new computers and stuff like that, right? So, so typically, so Lance is the IT person for the town. He also has a budget, and so he typically will present to the selectmen each year in the budget process what he sees. Lance. Lance. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he's willing to contribute. I bet he would be. And I do have an inventory of all the so, remember, Virginia's equipment is owned by the state. 
So her office is kind of out of our purview, but um, all the others I do have the information. So. Okay. Okay. Yep. That's probably as far as we're going to go with this tonight until we have more information. Okay. Um, other than the format stuff. Um, Did it put? I have the full format on my visor. Um, the road, Brad isn't here. I, I should have invited him. Uh, I've been busy. I didn't get to him. Um, I think we'll probably get him here for our next meeting and see. I, I, I know they have a, a written program for what they're going to do with the roads because I was at a couple of meetings and that's pretty much what he's going to submit to us is what their projection is for what they're going to do with all the roads in town as opposed to what they've already done which should go into the CIP as well. So. Does anybody else have any comments on the CIP before we move on to the next thing? Ben. We just have to make sure that we uh, review the, um, the federal regulations that are put forth about historic buildings. I have a booklet, and I'd be happy to give it. I only have a few booklets, but we can certainly buy more. Well, we're only going to do a priority list. I think the Heritage Commission will probably take that responsibility on making sure those things jive. I don't know that we would do that. But. Yeah, we, we should look at more of an overview and allow people who are more in-depth as far as the actual needs to go from that point forward. That would probably be more prudent as far as our input to the CIP. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're making the job easier. Subdivision plot, site plan, review checklist, working document. That's in the minutes that we were given out, so. There's actually a copy right there. Is that not the updated one? That's the latest and the greatest. Yeah, it was in the minutes as well, right? Yeah. Yes, but this is, right, but this is the revised. This is the working document. Which one? Right there, all yes. by itself? Let's have it. Yes. You gave it to me already. I have it. You got one? I believe I got one. Yeah, I got a bowl. Yep. Well, everybody's had this for a while. Before we make it permanent, we should go through this again and look and see if we need any more work on this. I, I don't see it. We're, yeah, it's a working document. We've removed, removed some of the... Uh, unnecessary verbiage and numbered items because they weren't pertinent or relevant or didn't have any meaning at all. I'd like to everybody look through it again one more time and make sure they don't see anything. that could be changed or improved. Now, George, was this uh, was included with the minutes that before we uh, put in our suggested changes? No, the suggested changes should be included in here, here. And, and they should be listed in the minutes as far as what was. Yeah. Okay. So I see on page uh, nine, comprehensive, comprehensive application form, yeah, with seven lines. That's in there. And page ten, delete item twenty-eight. Well, not bad. Update. This has all been upgraded, so. I may not have uh, the update, but what we have in the minutes here online doesn't show the width seven lines. That was going to be my comment. Seven lines on the uh, uh, plane with the endorsement on number seven, signature block. I'm sorry, what is the. Uh, I have on, on my notes from uh, last meeting. On number seven, the signature uh, signature blocks for plain board endorsement with seven lines. I don't have it listed on this from the uh, previous minutes. Yeah, I don't believe I got the uh, updated one. Oh, let me have an updated one. The updated one has seven lines. Yeah. Okay, I'm here. Just looking off the minutes from yesterday. 
Come on. Okay, yeah, that's better. Right. Right. Mr. Mr. Chair, I just, right. I just want to point out to everybody, um, one way to uh, tell him between this is in the um, in the header on the on the top right hand corner it says sub subdivision plat requirements slash site plan review checklist and read that working document eight thirteen twelve. I just want to Right, that. that's the designation. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, take your book. We're all going to read it anymore. We're going to watch him for that kind of stuff. I have your yeah, book. Yeah. It's safe. Um, I didn't let the cat out. Yeah, the one thing, uh, renumbering after uh, 27, we skipped 28, so 29. Yeah, we took 28 20. out, so yeah. number one from 29 should become 28 and continue More just on. a typo than anything. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Skips 28, goes to 29. Thank you so oh. much. Should be renumbered. We well, have to we're going to have 13 floors, we're just not going to have 28. <laughs> 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 this is all pretty cut and dry stuff. Mm -hmm. And the redundant stuff and the stuff that it makes sense we've yep. removed. Yep. And I don't see anything else here that becomes an inconvenience for the applicant. That's unreasonable to ask of them. We wouldn't have to have a rewrite for that renumbering. That's more just a clerical. Yep. Am I correct? Yep. So another, like I think, purely clerical issue is that um, we've got uh, two different checklists here. Yep. The first one, it's sentences. Everything ends with a period. The second one, it, there's, I mean, it's purely punctuation, right? The, the second one is just statements without periods, right? And so, um, I don't know if, if anyone cares about this, you know, stylistically making this uniform or not. It doesn't have any effect on what the meaning is, right? But um, that's something that I noticed. None of this is grammatically correct if you want to get right down to it. <laughs> I understand, it's a checklist, right? And, and, but, you know, like, in the first checklist, some of these are fairly long and actually have, you know, a couple sentences in them. And so having periods really makes it easy to write those and have multiple sentences. The second checklist, they happen to all be short. Well, the right? first, let me interrupt. I, I understand the first checklist isn't sentences either. It's just a group of words with a period after it because there's no verb no. in any of these if you look at them. So we can either take the periods out of this or add periods to the other one they would match. Quite a few of these are actually sentences. Well, there probably are a couple here and there, but. But you're right. I mean, some of these are just, you know. I don't see a sentence here. I've got to read and find one. Uh, number six, Platt shall be. I knew he was going to find them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, number, number six, Platt <laughs> shall be. But most of the other number, ones. Number five has a sentence, all Platts shall have. Oh, yeah. Well, most of them don't, though. I would say 85%. Right. I'm just saying that if, if, if you structure it as if it were, could be a sentence with a period, it makes it easy to add a sentence of clarification if we want to down the road. I don't yeah, know. So I, you're saying we should put periods at the end of the other ones on the next page? If, if, if this were my document and I were writing it, I, would, I, I like consistency. I'd put periods. I don't have a problem with that, Rob. Let's do it. Periods are a good idea. George. Take a note of it and let's do that before we, we're going to change the, uh, we're going to blow the whole budget on period. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good, he's, he's, got, he's got a valid point. I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's valid. Uh, no, the good thing is that internally, each of these checklists was consistent with itself, right? It's just yeah. that when you look at them as a whole, you, see, you yeah. start to see that inconsistency. Yeah, there's a, it, it, it's, it's fine. I think if you take the periods off, the stuff, it's not sentences. Just put periods that more incomplete sentences. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, what is the next step here? Is the next step for us to accept the working document as a change to the the? Um, that is correct. This is in this, the, the rules of procedure. The rules, rules of procedure. procedure. Thank you, George. That's correct. Mr. Chairman, I uh, I move that we accept. The working document marked at 8-13-2012 as uh, changes to the rules of procedure uh, with the two uh, 
amendments, uh, the renumbering, and the punctuation. Okay. There's a motion. Does anyone second that motion? Uh, Good. Um, I, would, I wouldn't word it as an amendment. I word it as clerical correction. If it's an amendment, that would generate another rewrite. Typographical. Yeah. Cler it's clerical correction. I want to reword it. Reword it. Make the motion for George so it goes on the record correctly. I move. Sure. I move that we accept the working document from 8-13-2012 uh, as uh, as part of the rules of procedure with the two clerical changes that we noted the renumbering of to around number 28 in the first checklist and punctuation in the second checklist Good. do I hear a second on the floor yeah, any other discussion uh, Mr. Chairman, just to be clear, I withdrew. I, my intent You're was to withdraw my first motion and remake it, just so it's clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other discussion at this point? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes. You got something done. There it is. You know, Everyone read the rest. Well, so, I've got a few more items to cover. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Now, does I believe that this now kicks in that we need to submit this to town clerk and yes. blah blah blah, right? Okay, just making sure that for her signature, Senator. Right, and then yeah, there's a whatever that procedure is that we just went through. Yes. For the other changes, we got to do it again. She will. Yes, she will, she Virginia will get that. I don't know, not tonight because it's a little late. I think um, maybe not. You got until late to You got until late yeah, we have time. He's got to fix the number the last couple of go rounds. We'll yeah, you got to fix that. That's correct. It'll, it will be next. It won't be today. Okay. Seven thirty. Anybody in the mood to tackle home-based business tonight? Make a motion to carry it over to the next meeting. A second. Anybody else want to discuss this? Um, I think that given that we're only meeting once every month. Yes. And it's 50 degrees out. I'm, I'm, we're getting later in the year, right? And yeah. so um, I, I just, you know, we, we would want to get this done in the next three or four meetings and I'm not sure how people feel whether we need whether we have plenty of time or whether we are pressed for time. It's to get September. Something. Right, so October, November, December. December. Three know. meetings. Yep. So my suggestion would be that if either if we are if we really do want to have something for March, we may want to make some progress on it this meeting. How does everybody else feel about that? I know how I feel about it. I think we should revisit this thing tonight and discuss the things we talked about last time anyway. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing here, and it isn't that late. So, I think it really needs to work. I think that's, to be honest with you, CIP is going to take care of itself to a certain degree because the people that are involved are actually doing their job. Right. The only person or people that are going to fix that ordinance is this board. So either we do it or we don't do it. And if we don't put the time in, we're not going to get it done. So I'd like to go through it. That's it. So let's. Chairman, there's, yeah. a motion, there's a motion on the table. This is quite important. There's a motion on the table. You uh, moved. This, what was your motion again, Ron? He moved that we. Uh, I, I moved that we did anybody second that motion? I did. Ooh. But at this point, I withdraw my motion. Okay. Well, that was part of the discussion. How's that? If you're withdrawing it, then it makes it a moot point. I forgot that you had the motion on the floor. Okay, we've got this paperwork right here attached to the minutes. 
Now uh, we get four of eleven, five of eleven, six of eleven. Three, four of eleven. There's no sense twisting arms, but we all really need to get this done for a little bit. How about the... Uh, no, the timeline is a very good point, by the way. Thank you. Let me pull up our existing ordinance, too. Suggestion on number six. I know we had some discussion over that and the wording of that. Um, I would suggest that uh, we alter six to reflect uh, the home occupations and or home based businesses shall remain limited in scope and as a replacement uh, a main residency must be maintained on the uh, property in question uh, to operate a business unless that usage is agricultural in nature, which was uh, Cliff's contention. Are you on six or seven? I'm on six. All right, look, can I make a suggestion here? If we inject it there. And I, I don't know whether you think it's money well spent, but I kind of do think it is if we do it properly. Mm -hmm. That if we take one of these things and we all agree on what we're trying to achieve with a particular numbered item, like you just came up with an idea, yeah. you're trying to achieve point. If the majority of the board feels that that's the point we want to achieve, a very simple way, instead of us hacking language back and forth, is to, who's going to review it anyway, give it to the town attorney. She'll write the language in five minutes. Also oh, put it in written and writing, typed out. Yes, yeah. I okay. spoke to her about this. Um, I don't think it's a very expensive proposition. If we can agree on what we're trying to express, we can get the language written that is legal because we're going to ask her to review it for legality anyway, mm -hmm. at some point. I mean, that's, that's a given. We're not going to just create it and put it in front of the town. So why don't we go through all of these things and any additional stuff we want, might add make a notation if, if that's what we're trying to achieve. I mean, the, the board has to be unanimous, or not unanimous, but majority for that particular item. So let's start with uh, number one again. We went through this last week, or last meeting. So Mr. Chairman, if our goal is to write a list of things we want to achieve, rather than go through the wording, should we I mean, maybe we maybe should have a different list, a different document that we are using as our working document. I mean, because there's there are goals embedded in the words that are put here, right? I mean, like number six that uh, Jim was talking about, right? That's as written. It's that it you can only do one of these things in conjunction with a residential use, right? Jim wants to change that to be residential or agricultural. I mean, we could, that's a much simpler sentence to understand than, than some of the verbiage that's going to be here. Do we want to rewrite this list to, to be that form, or do you want to try to do it off of this list, these well, wording as it let's, is? Let's go through the list and, and, and make a, a separate list of things we might want to add. Either way, we're going to have to structure language if we're going to alter any of these or add new ones. Mm -hmm. okay. And my suggestion was, um, yeah, of course, all attorneys are in business to charge a fee for stuff they do. However, with the three months that we have, and if we want to actually affect any of this, we can get it done, I think, fairly quickly in that fashion. Does anybody feel differently about that? They think it's a waste of time and money. I don't think it's a waste of time and money, but I just want to uh, clear. Do you want to have uh, George take notes as we go for the change? Sure. Or do you want to have them written and presented to, to the board? I'd have him take notes. Have him take notes as we go. Why not? That's okay. what he's doing anyway. Oh, yeah. Hopefully. 
I, I, <laughs> let, let's start with number one. The property owners of record manager, at least you live in any structure, use a bed and breakfast. Before we start, uh, can I, Mr. Yeah. Chairman? This, this whole document, home occupations, uh, home-based businesses, this should be separate from agriculture. I think agriculture businesses in this town are different than this whole regulation. It is. It's already well, that's, that's that's inherent. inherent. Completely different. Well, um, that's inherent already. Yeah, agricultural, hey, got, got, business, <clears throat> agricultural business and agricultural pursuits are not controlled by this document at all. Do we need to clarify that? No. Nope. Nope. Because okay. it's already clarified other places in our in our zoning ordinance. This is just running something out of here. This is this, this is, is just a business that's non agricultural. Okay. This is a secondary use. Of agricultural land okay. or residential property. Let's okay. go to number one. All right, that's good. That's good. That's how it works. Agriculture is not affected by this in any way. Very good. The property owners of record manager or lessee shall live in any structure used as a bed and breakfast. Um, I see no reason to change that, and I can't imagine doing it. Does anyone else feel differently on that subject? Oh, yeah. That, that's fine. Uh, any shall live on the property used as a bed and breakfast. No, then it's a hotel. That's, I mean, bed and breakfast bed and actually breakfast. means something fairly specific, right? You're having somebody, you're having people come and stay in your home. You're cooking them yep. a meal, right? That's, you're providing them breakfast in the morning. Right. For a fee. Right. Our zoning elsewhere prohibits hotels and boarding houses, right? Yep. Which is different than a bed and breakfast. That's, so we're not going to change that. Adequate off street parking, we say. Well, 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 I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Unless we decide that we want to allow things like boarding houses and motels and hotels. And I'm not suggesting that we, I personally don't think we should. Well, but, th but I mean, th that's, that's not anything to do with this one. This is strictly bed and breakfast. She'll live in any structure used as a bed and breakfast. If we were going to allow boarding houses and bordellos, we would then make a particular sentence that allowed those particular things because they wouldn't fall into the bed and breakfast category. This is just addressed to B and B's, right? Well, some properties have so, a little structure. I was going to vote for so, so the so when I wrote the original this original proposal, what I was trying to do was get away from listing. Uh, occupations or types of businesses as much as possible and make it so that basically any business is allowed except unless it's unless elsewhere we've prohibited it right and like we've got a list i don't know where i don't remember what page it's on but that lists like you can't have boarding houses and things like that right and so i left the bed and breakfast in there since you know that's something that's clearly allowed in our current zoning. We want to make sure it's clearly allowed, and that it's di there's a difference between a boarding ha uh, a boarding house and a bed and breakfast and and, and a bordello. But if we're gonna if we were to get rid of the restrictions, I'm just gonna ignore you. I have the floor. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if if you if we wanted to like not re not have the restrictions against hotels and and uh, boarding houses and things like that. I think that the bed and breakfast would sort of, there wouldn't be anything related to that at all. We could just remove any mention of bed and breakfast. Of course it's allowed. And you can, as is any other way of you, have people stay on your property, right? I'm not suggesting that we do that, but I mean, that's sort of why this is here specifically. This is one of the few places where it calls out a particular occupation. Well, I get, I get the it. point, Rob, and it, but it's already in our ordinance too. I mean, already in our ordinance of bed and breakfast. I understand. I'm not suggesting yeah. we should outlaw them. No, no, I know that. But I, what I kind of want to do is go, get through these things and then get into the language that might permit any kind of business that doesn't affect the neighbor in an adverse way, like a junkyard, okay, without coming out and making a list. That's where we are. Right. And but we, I want to go through these so we all have them in our mind very quickly without okay. a lot of discussion. Bang through them and say, okay, now what do we want to achieve? How do we do that? Okay, go through them. Okay. Without any. Uh, okay, that's a real quick. Until you get to the end. I, I don't want to change them and have a discussion on each one for half an hour. Adequate off street parking with safe ingress and egress of vehicles shall be available. That's kind of a no brainer. I mean, we have to, ha that has discussion. to be safe ingress and egress because that's a point of contention anywhere. So, does anybody feel different on that? 
external storage of occupational equipment. And supplies shall be screened from the view of abutters in the right of way. That is an issue. And that's something we do have to discuss. Because there are some people that own things that are not necessarily agricultural in nature like tractors and their pieces of equipment. And there is no place to screen them or put them out of the way. I mean, so. So, so Mr. Chairman, our current zoning says, just, just so that we understand where we're at. I know where we're at. External storage of occupational equipment and supplies will be screened from view either by fencing or dense veg vegetation. That's where our current zoning says. Yeah, I know. Well, screen from view in the brothers of right away simplifies it actually a little bit. It's less restrictive. I was trying it to. It doesn't make have it, fences, and it doesn't. Have trying to make it. A little, I was trying to make it a little vegetation. less restrictive without making a major change to the zoning. I was. I was specifically trying to not sneak stuff in that was going to be a major change. If we want to make a major change, we should go ahead and do it. But I mean, well, that's what I'm asking. I, I brought. The, I know it's in the zoning already. My question is, is that onerous? Is there someone with a with a backhoe that they may be used for work someplace? I have one, but it's in my barn, screened from view, so it's irrelevant to me. But is it something we want to keep in here, or do we want to give someone the ability to park their backhoe next to their house? I, yeah. so, well, this also speaks to vehicles, not just equipment, but anything. It basically says occupational equipment. That's yeah, mouse plumbing and heating. Yeah. That is that is a van that has a company logo on it. Yep. That is a pickup truck that has company wording on it. Those all have to be, according to our document today, though it's not strongly enforced, has to be screened under this new one as well. Which means and, and, and I'm going to pick on HD Electric because his truck's parked in his parking in his driveway, quite honestly, a lot. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but according to this document and our current zoning, he can't do that. Happy's firewood. That's why I brought it up. Yeah, let's take Not it just off. Happy's firewood because I, I, I'm not no, doing too much. But the, but the point is, if someone is running a business out of the house, like let's say that they're welding and they're making things and that's legitimate in their garage and they're selling them. Is it acceptable for them to have a, a box truck out in front that's their personal day vehicle that says Joe's welding on it 20 feet long? That's a different story than a person that, yeah, they run their business out of their home because they do the books there and they answer the phone there, but they go someplace and build something or do something during the day. They don't operate on the property, so they're not a convenience. Do we want to discern between those two things in some fashion, if it's possible, to not prohibit, even though we don't enforce it now, but we could in the future, somebody from having their work truck in their driveway? Okay, go ahead, Cliff. Well, another example is driving up Moose Mountain Road. There's a, a certain gravel pit, I won't mention Eddie's name, um, that you literally can see the gravel pit from the road. If you look right down through where his house is, his but, barn is. But that's not a home occupation. You can see straight down there and you can see the equipment parked in the back of the house. But that's not a home occupation. Sure it is, because he lives right there on the property. We have separate, we have separate zones. Yeah, but his equipment is not in the gravel pit. It's up on the property. That's my point. It's not that he's back there in so, the sand So I think, just to clarify, I think that we have separate zoning that covers the <coughs> pit. And the equipment that he, for the pit, I think would be, I don't know what zoning would cover that. Now, I an think the individual- An excavator is an excavator no matter where you park it. Okay. But, well, well, but, but an ex excavator for an agriculture, for a farm, is, comp is not covered by any of this at all, right? So I, I think that just, we just got to be careful with the examples we choose. Well, I think, and that's now, why I'm throwing this out there is because this is a very dangerous little sentence. Well, can, can we not quibble over this for a minute? Here's, here's my question to all of us. Do we want to work on this so that this business about occupation, equipment, and supplies, 
as it stands right now, we have the right to tell somebody, screen it. You can't park your truck in your driveway and that's the way it is, whether you have a garage or not. That's where it is. Do we want to do something about this? Do we want to make it? I think it's reasonable. I think it would be very reasonable for us to work on this because I think we shouldn't have zoning that we just ignore and don't enforce because it's un it would be unreasonable to do so. I think it would be unreasonable for you not to be able to park your pickup truck in front of your house, you know, or HD Electric to park his van in front of his house. I think that'd be unreasonable to enforce that. Now, okay. at the same time, somebody maybe who owns, I don't know, uh, 10 trucks for doing septic stuff or something like that, maybe if all those are parked in his front yard, maybe that would be onerous on the neighbors, right? I think there's somewhere in between. That's right? not his personal transportation vehicles. Right. So. I, so my okay. So my personal feeling would be, it would, I think we should. It would be a good thing to work on this one, to try to make it match what we want people to be able to do. Everybody else, opinion. Work on it. Get it fixed. Take it out. <laughs> okay. Well, that's what we got to do. Everybody's opinion counts here, and then we're going to do something to fix it. If yeah. Can't we just like define what occupational equipment is? Yeah, I think that's what that's what it would come down to. Very, right? very well, maybe. Um, I just don't think we should be telling anybody they can't drive their truck that says their electrical thing on the side or their. Well, I don't care trailer, if it's. Or a trailer that, that promotes a business that they pull behind their pickup truck that they have no place else to park. That's correct. Exactly. I agree with that. I mean, we all have things. But, but there is know, a difference between that and someone who tweaks the law and uses it. For instance, they are making carburetor parts in their garage, which is a thing. If they don't pollute the environment, don't do anything. Then they get their tractor trailer out in front that says Joe's carburetor parts. I don't know. Let's see the big the big box van that was parked down here on 109 that says uh, McLaughlin Electric that's always parked right there on the roadway. What's the difference? Yeah, but the people don't go to McLaughlin Electric to get their electric done at at his house. That's his vehicle that he parks, and maybe he should have screened it. I'm not going to argue that. Well, well that's that, that's my point, and I agree with Rob that we should on our books that we're not willing to enforce because two things are going to happen. You have regulations that you aren't going to enforce, that we don't enforce, then you're creating a situation where your whole regulations, your whole zoning rights can be called into question because now you're choosing and picking which regulations out of that book that you're wishing to enforce and which ones you're not enforcing, which gives people legal recourse to say that you're picking on me and you're not being fair because HD Electric parks his, his pickup truck right in his driveway, which is a screening issue. That's it's a very minor, but they may be doing something totally different and, and that is that we really want to prevent it from happening in town, like a used car salesman having a ton of vehicles parked in his front yard saying, buy me, you know. But because we're not enforcing one, how can we justly enforce another? That's discriminating. Okay, I, I agree with all this. So uh, hopefully the selectman will have the prudence to not be that selective on who they enforce the zoning with. But, but you never no, know who's going to be sitting on that board. That's the, no, yeah. that's, I agree. I agree. I, I agree. So uh, let's come up with some just suggestions on how we change this from people here with their brain well, this, quickly this, simply and we'll jot this, them down this item three seems to me like it could be directed towards people with construction excavation equipment and supplies like pallets of pipes and wood etc a yard that looks like a like a stockyard how about this if we were to and maybe I'm wrong but tell me if I am if we structure it in this way, external storage, occupational equipment supplies that service a business that is operated on the property that draws a clientele to the property. Then, Be screened from, I'm making a suggestion, don't interrupt me. When I get finished and you have something to say, you've got time to say it. Now let me get back into my thought. External storage of occupational equipment and supplies shall be screened from the view of butters and right. Okay, equipment and supplies. 
um, especially equipment. Equipment that, in a, somehow to put the word in, I had it going before and I lost it. That service a business, you had, you had, you said before, that service a business. That, that draws a clientele to the property. Shall be screened from you. Do we want to approach it that way? In other words, a, a tradesman or a person that brings his vehicle to his house, that's his day truck that he operates his business off site with. We don't want to be prejudicial to this person. Everybody that's in business with himself has something on their vehicle that operates that way. Do we want to approach it that way? What do you I, think? I, I think that we probably all would, I'm guessing we would all agree that at least somebody's personal vehicle. Steve, I think on your truck you have something, that, right? But of course you should be able to park your car. You have to be able to park your truck at your house because that's where you're, you're, where you're going, right? I think that we'd all agree that that's reasonable, but right? But we've run into a difficulty. But it's not printed that way here. No, I understand that's not what it says. I'm just saying trying to get to what we want the effect of the wording to be. Okay. Right? I think that we'd all, we'd all agree that... A person, pers a personal vehicle, whatever that exactly that means. But you know, the truck you drive to work every day. Should we limit it to one or two? That might be an approach you, you, that you can, you know, a. I don't know what the classifications of cars and trucks are, but I mean, you know, class whatever vehicle. Um, one day you got one kind of job. Do you take truck A? The next day you got you're off someplace with truck B. No, but I'm, I'm just saying that. I mean. I don't. I think maybe if the truck, if your personal vehicle is an eighteen wheeler, probably we'd say maybe that's not something that you should have parked in your driveway. That might be occupational equipment, not sort of in the personal vehicle category, right? So somewhere in between there, there's. <clears throat> I think we'd probably all agree that, <clears throat> that it could be allowed. I think that if we, if somebody has piles of lumber or pipe or something like that in their front yard, maybe that's not reasonable for the neighbors to have to deal with. Right. Whether they're doing, using that lumber or pipe on site or off site probably is irrelevant. First, I think external storage of occupational equipment should be divorced completely from supplies that be two separate sentences because they're two different types of things. Nobody drives their supplies to work. You know, I list them separately. It's real simple to make a different ordinance that applies to supplies versus, you know. So uh, uh, just one, one final thought and I'll let everyone else have their say. Um, we could, so we don't have to cover every case. We want to cover the majority of the cases. The, those additional cases can always go to the ZBA for a variance. If they've got a reasonable situation that doesn't fit with exactly the wording we came up with, that's not the end of the world. We don't want everyone, we don't want Steve just because he wants to park at his house to have to go get to the ZBA for a variance, right? That's silly. We don't want zoning that does that. But if, if somebody has, you know, some odd, you know, doesn't fit in with whatever, whatever we're doing, we come up with, they also, they still have recourse. Okay. Jim. Uh, I was going to bring up this, the mention that uh, Cliff brought up about a trailer. It's not your main uh, conve uh, conveyance, but you may have it at your house and no other place to store it. It may have the advertisement on the side of it. And that would fall into the variance uh, category that, uh, that Robert just mentioned. Well, the guy down in Wakefield, right in the corner of the dump road, has that very thing. He's got a tractor trailer there with a bunch of stuff written on it, and he has three lifts. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if we really want to keep that line in here, I have a, a suggested change of wording. Every feasible attempt shall be made to screen. Every what? Say it again. Every feasible attempt shall be made to screen external equipment and supplies from the view of the butters and the red boys. Every feasible event. Now you're making it subjective to whoever, who had, to whoever has power at the time. I still think equipment and supplies should be divorced. Supplies could become a mountain of stuff. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it can be, it can sit there in the yard and rot. Look at Terriac. But equipment is, is your truck. That's a, it's just a different thing. I don't think we should well, put them together. If you're a construction company and you have 10 excavators or a logging company or whatever, and you're storing your equipment in, in, at your place, I think that you're, it's not unreasonable the neighbors would want that screened or out of their view. Logging, you've got to take out of here because that's an agricultural pursuit. 
Well, maybe quantity is, it, is, an, is an item to insert. No more than so many vehicles. Let me tell you how Wolfboro does it. They allow one, and everything else has to be put in a garage or screen. They allow one. That doesn't mean we have to do that, but they do. That's how they've approached that, this problem, allowing one. We can allow two. And if you allow ten, then you got a problem. you got a parking lot. Which... I think we should take it out because we already have a regulation that says we don't allow junkyards in Brookfield. If it becomes to a point where it's an eyesore, then it's a junkyard. I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, 10 shiny new excavators, I think, is probably still an eyesore. Depends on who you are. Yeah. <laughs> I know a, young, a lot of young boys that think excavators are pretty cool. I understand, but it's. It definitely is not a re you get you're starting to get away from the residential agricultural yeah. field of yeah, the district, which is shall we shall we incorporate the nineteen excavators cannot be run between the hours of six a.m. and seven a.m. seven p.m. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> That's already in there, you know. Yeah, I know. But I think we're trying to keep our community. I know we wrote this, and the idea behind it, we are not a gated community, we are not a retirement community, we are a working class community. We have people who work for a living. Why are we, and the whole goal of this is, is to allow people to work and to have, have the things that's necessary to do their, to do their employment or their jobs or, or their occupational buildings. If, if you've got so much equipment on your property that it's an eyesore, you're no longer a residential, you are a commercial property. Right, you're not a, you're not <laughs> a home occupation anymore. So, so, if you're storing your equipment, excuse me for a minute, if you're storing your equipment on your property, that doesn't mean you're a home occupation. This doesn't have that much to do with home occupation. This really consists of what vehicles are parked in your lot. It doesn't have anything at all to do with home occupation unless there happens to be a home occupation there that's pertinent to it. Well, this, this well, does, it, it, does, well, does this ordinance include professional trades? Or is that a separate thing that we're going to put back in? We're not, on, we're not on professional trades right now. We're talking well, about... But, but, but hang on, but we're changing this article. The professor, I, my, my, but, intent, my intent was that the trades would be covered by this okay. as home-based businesses. That's what I wanted to make sure. So home-based business means you're basing your business out of your home, right? Well, and it may be done the work. Industry, that's business. not necessarily true. The whole thing. I, I, you mean they have an office in your home? It might be as simple as an office in your home, or it might be that the work actually gets done there, right? That's, it's a bro very, I mean, we, maybe we need to nail down exactly what the definition is. But getting back to the equipment. So number five says, as, re as it's written right now in the working document, the residential agricultural character of the district shall be maintained. That's right. So let me ask you this. Could we just say that number five covers equipment in a subjective way, but it gives the selectmen a directive to make sure that it doesn't it, become a commercial it, lot. It doesn't right. become non residential agricultural. Right? That still makes a, that's a arbitrary whim of the moment thing though. What's subjective no, to one select? No, 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 no. I disagree with that. Yeah, the, the, I'm sorry. the superior court will definitely weigh in with what's a reasonable interpretation of that. If, so, if someone can afford to go to superior court, you're right. But sometimes nobody has fifteen hundred to ten thousand dollars to hand their lawyer to get the town to superior court, and that's an onus that you place on the particular burden that you put on the person that's stuck with the with the refusal. So we yep. should consider that. And, and he doesn't have any guarantee that when he gets to court, he's going to prevail for the ten grand he just threw at an attorney. So I don't know. I mean, I here at court stay up there and ISOP for the moment. So, so Gary, I agree with you that I think we make our intent more clear if we address equipment. And I think that saying that you can have one vehicle or two vehicles or three, whatever the number is, I think that that shows what our intent was. And it's pretty reasonable. And anybody that thinks that they should have 19 excavators is really pushing it on their so, neighbors. It's so not reasonable. Like, For Eddie, it's a different story. It should, it, gravel banks are what they are, and they're permitted, they're in use in town. That's the way it is. 
and he's grandfathered anyway, and there's not going to be another Moose Mountain with an Eddie Mason on it in this town. So <laughs> we can't make an ordinance that puts the one sole exclusion to the rule or except get a rule out of town or out of business. We so can't three could come out. Huh? Three could come out then. It's not in the spirit of this uh, document. Hmm. Well, uh, maybe part of three can come out. I don't know about supplies. I think supplies is something yeah, we have to talk about. It's a whole different animal. It has nothing to do with equipment. So Equipment's a vehicle, maybe. Supplies could be a mountain of crap, and nobody should have the property devalued. I'm sorry, I love independence and free thinking libertarianism all day long, but if somebody moved next to me and made a junkyard next to me and lowered the value of my property, I won't be a happy guy. I mean, a junkyard, you know, a junkyard. I'm not talking about on We know a lot of junkyards in Brookfield. We already have a, we have a zone, a regulation. There's a couple in Wakefield and there's a beauty in Wolfboro. Yeah, but they're not Brookfield. No, I they're know, not. but that doesn't mean. We're doing pretty good. But we're, but we're writing, we're, we're a planning board, we're making ordinances. Uh, I don't know, does everybody disagree with me on supplies and equipment separated or do you agree? I think we could leave it there, leave it there, but soften it by saying, I don't know if we call them personal vehicles, or something, but say you can, you know, uh, that, 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 that item number three does not apply to personal vehicles or something like that. So make a way to personal it. transport. Okay, or something. that's a one way to approach it. Item number I just, three. What do you guys think should be done? What do you think? Should down with number three. You want to take it out? Wait, so, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. You probably didn't hear Steve. <coughs> Steve. had something to say. I, sure. I, I have an example. Okay. Um, a neighbor, I won't mention any names, has a hobby of repairing trucks. He has a pile of truck parts. <coughs> They're in plain view of the road. They're at the back part of his property. And would that be considered? This is a hobby now. It's not an occupation. Doesn't make any money on it. It's strictly a hobby. Then that's excluded. That's not in the home based business ordinance. Okay. I'm just bringing that up as an example. But if he keeps collecting them and they keep growing, it could be a hundred Well, we do have we yeah. do have ordinances that prohibit non registered vehicles to be sitting around for more than a year. No, they're not. There's no unregistered vehicles. All vehicles are registered that are complete. It's the incomplete. The mix. <laughs> but, well, but those, they they have a you know, that, that would be something that would not be addressed under home-based businesses. That would be addressed under a different part. Right. If they have a chassis, they're a vehicle. Okay. And they have to be registered. Whether they're operating or not, they have to be registered. Yeah, oh, that I know. Okay. 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 Rob, you said something before. Did it clock? You want to see the thing removed completely. Yes. I can honestly tell you, in all the time that I've been in this town, I've never seen this enforced. I've never seen it enforced, but I've seen. And I've seen a lot of commercial, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of construction equipment. I've seen a lot of construction and, and other supplies sitting right out in the open. So I mean, I understand when it was put in and what the spirit behind it was, and it's not what we're trying to accomplish here. That was put in to keep this town from having such businesses and, and, and stuff from operating within this town and to keep this a gated, enclosed, retired community. This was put in in 1998. Yeah, I know. And it was put in and it was written and authored by Martha Pike. And Martha Pike recused herself because we forced her to because Peckham was running the board because she was having a problem with the guy with the tractor tether in the yard next door was on the board at the time. I know where this came from. <laughs> I wasn't going to go with names and dates, but... Let's get rid of it. Yes, sir. Let's change the thought process. Let's just say number three is non-existent. It's not in there. And I have a complaint, or somebody has a complaint about their neighbor because they feel there's too many tractors, there's too much stuff going on. What method would they use to, to stop that person? Come to, the, come to us, come to the selectmen. Select 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 so there is a method that if there is a problem, 
it can be taken care of. But only under the provisions provided for by the planning board, the legislative body. It's like we can't make up laws. Sure we can. We can make, we can make selectman ordinances. You, 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 yeah, but you can't just make them out. At the stop, you got to run them before the town. You just can't make up an ordinance and enforce it in the middle of the year. We can as long as it, it complies with the RSAs. If it complies with the zoning ordinance. It complies with the RSAs. I don't think so. We don't make zoning ordinances. We're, we cannot make a zoning ordinance. No, but if you want to make a law, you got to run it through we a town meeting. No, oh, yeah, you do. No, you do not. I think so. I, I think. But anyway, you go can ahead. ask inspector, but I don't think you're right. As long as those three people, so, as long as it has a majority vote at the selectman's board, we can make a nuisance law at the selectman's level. Uh, you the may. They did. They made. They made a. Um, what was it? Uh, the one about the automobiles that go up and down the. the yeah. The laying, was, laying rubber. Yeah, laying rubber. That is a selectman's ordinance. It has nothing to do with zoning, and it never went through. It you may prohibit it, but I don't think you can make it an ordinance in the town documentation. Sure. That you cannot lay rubber unless you run it through the town meeting. Yeah. So, no. so Gary, anyway, okay. so, so Gary, I believe that Clifton's right, but there are limitations, right? Yes. The, the select, selectman's ordinance cannot be used to regulate land use. Right. Right. Yeah. But they can they can regulate the use on the roads, yeah. right? Okay, and stuff like that, right? Life so that's safety, what, perhaps. Yes. Well, well, that's where like laying rubber. We, is, we when, can regulate you know, nuisances. Land use? No, 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 I didn't say land use. I said nuisances. Nuisances, by definition, leave the property that you own. That's right. Right, and so they can regulate that because you can't. You mean they, they can't can regulate how much you park on your property. They, they can't tell me what I can do on my property. Aside, if as long as what I'm doing on my property doesn't leave my property, if I'm making noise, making vibration, making noxious fumes, and those are leaving my property, then the selectmen they they can have a nuisance ordinance that that then would restrict what I'm doing. Uh, I'll give you an example of, 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 of the use. I understand that, but we're uh, talking about you, a stack I'll of material. I'll give you a bona fide example of, of an ordinance that was produced by the town, the, the selectmen, with Eddie Mason Santa. The selectmen created, voted on at a selectman's meeting, hours of operation for any business in the sand pit. He could not have, he could not operate the sand pit except for specific sets of hours because it was a nuisance to the neighbors and the neighbors complained. And that was the agreement that they came out. But the select board did it and they voted on it in a selectman's meeting, not at a town meeting, at a selectman's meeting. And created the selectmen have the power to make selectmen's ordinances as long as it has a majority vote and it does not violate the state RSAs and is not more lenient than the state RSAs. I understand that point. That so, so what you're telling me is that if I want to stack cribbing up on my property, 200 feet tall, the selectman can come in and make a law that says I can't do that if it's visible from off from off of your property. Not if it's if, forget what's written in here. No, no, no. If if it's visible from off your property and creating a nuisance for a neighbor, they can act on it. So you're telling me if I if I have if I stack. Uh, I, would have to, I don't know. Again, this is supplies, but that goes back to the junkyard status. If that cribbing is just sitting there and sitting there and rotting. Junkyard is one thing. I, I'm not talking about junkyard. Okay, and, and, and a definition of a junkyard falls in when you've got more more supplies and materials than you can utilize. <laughs> Who defines that? Uh, <laughs> Selectman. Uh, <laughs> I think state law does. My point is, if I'm a builder and I decide I'm going to have a buy on wood, and I stack, <laughs> I get a good big load of wood. It's going to leave my property someday it may. But I'm going to stack it in my front yard, and it's 12 feet tall by 100 feet wide. Does the selectman have the right to tell me I got to get that out of my yard? That's what I'm asking you. Do you think you have the right to do that without as, without that being defined in zoning? I think if the neighbors complain, you might. <laughs> I'm saying I don't think so. I'm saying I think that uh, they don't really like to stand it, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, I think okay, that, I think it that if we, depends on whether it's land use or a nuisance. If we had number five in there, yep, the residential agricultural character of the, of the district shall be maintained. Then the select would have a leg to stand on, yep, and say, you know what, this giant pile of lumber you no longer doesn't really fit. You got to screen it. You, you got to screen it. You got to plant trees. You got to put up a fence. You got to move it 
down into the gully. Unless you yeah. milled the lumber off your own land, then they can't do anything. Right. Well, because now that's an agricultural pursuit. That's right. 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 So now then you're arguing against our argument of two years ago, but go ahead. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Gary. That, I mean, so if, it, if it came off the land, it would be fine. If a nuisance develops. Yeah, that's why I'm saying three shouldn't even be there. Because why do we keep making rules for everybody trying to micromanage every possibility for everything? No but argument for me. But if one person has a problem, they should have a method to, you know, arbitrate what their issue right. is. But why do we have to have these rules for everything? It's, so yeah. so my, my answer would be that the rules are not for the people. The rules are for the selectmen. Right? We're trying to define the guidelines that we want the selectmen to enforce. Exactly. If we give the, if we have, if we don't give any guidance, the selectmen will just do whatever they think is right. And, and the old boys club, and, 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 used to be. Exactly. You get back to the old, boy, old boys club where it depends on who you know as far as what you can get away with. And so these, I mean, except the, for now the, the FBI gets involved, the, 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 so. the law should be about keeping the government in check, and that's really what we're doing here, right? We're trying to say how much the government can limit what we can do on our property. Okay, I buy it. So you're feeling that this. External storage of occupied equipment supply shall be screened from the view of abutters in the right of way. Is it really necessary because the residential agriculture character of the district shall be maintained? Am I correct? I think that if we anticipate that one of the ways that people are going to infringe on their neighbor's right to enjoy their property is having big piles of stuff and equipment and stuff like that, it doesn't hurt for us to say that somewhere in some way and fashion that we understand that and we expect that that needs to be limited in scale and scope. Do you feel that number three is un unnecessary? I think we could live without it, but I think we'd be better off with something that, that indicates that we think that some amount of like personal vehicles are acceptable, right? If we don't have, so Gary, here's the issue, right? What, if we don't have number three at all, and we're relying on number five to, to, for this, the select, a selectman could say, you know what, it's not residential to have a, you know, elect, you know electric... Very subjective, you're right. Right, and I think that we, I, I would say that we want to protect ourselves against those selectmen saying, no, you can't do that because it, it's not exactly residential. The residential agricultural carrier of the district shall be maintained but this clause shall not be applied to personal vehicles that advertise or something like that would do that same trick. Yeah, Register. Get vehicles. rid of three and enhance five. You, yes, if you get rid of three and enhance five, you might do the same thing. How do you feel about it, Steve? Well, it sounds good. Uh, just We're not there yet. But no, no, just an example of uh, going back to when uh, John Crowell was putting up his gas station, his repair auto repair down there. One of the questions was asked to him, what about your signage and what are you going to do with your trucks? Because all his trucks have signs on them. He says, I'm going to park them out front. It's on my property and they're going to have terms so you can read the signs as you go by. They couldn't do a damn thing about it. But that's a commercial zone. Yeah. That's yeah. a different time. Well, they, have, they, have, they have a sign ordinance that is limited. But whether personal registered personal vehicle. No, I understand that there's always a catch twenty two to everything. But but you sort it sounds good in what you okay. Ed, you kinda like it too. I'm getting you do too and you do too. And Jim, do you how do you feel about this? Number three going away. I'm just curious. And I've, enhancing I'm, number five. Enhancing number five, definitely because five is vague. Uh, Number three definitely sounds discriminatory, so you can tax somebody for. Oh boy, we business. have a consensus. So I amazing. I, I wouldn't go that far. Right. So, <laughs> so okay. So no, Gary, can I? Yes. One thought. So I, I think that we need to keep in mind that we have two goal. I think we actually have two goals here. One is allowing people to do what they want on their property, and the other is allowing their neighbors. To not suffer too much from their 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 neighbor's liberty, right? Yep. And the third aspect would be to make sure that the government doesn't is properly constrained in how they apply that balancing act, right? I think that's sort of what we're, we should right, be. You know, so we have to we have to think about okay, well, if I wanted to do something, how do I want it worded that it, that it keeps anyone from saying no to me? 
But at the same time, you have to think about, well, what if my neighbor were doing sort of the worst case? How do I get, how do I protect, how, what, what wording do I want to protect me from them getting out of control, right? That's sort of the balancing act that the zoning has to go through. Well, we do have to remember also the provisions of permissive zoning. And whatever, as you're saying, whatever we're not allowing is actually not legal. Right, but the, the way this is being worded right. is being is, is no, we basically allowing everything. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. we, have, we, we really do have a consensus here. Mm -hmm. It's just the language is the problem. We do that so much we argue about. No, but that's good. No, but everybody feels the same. There isn't three people over here that really hates this, and three people that love it. Everybody's kind of got the same thing. That's all I'm talking about. Now I would, I'm gonna, and I'm not going to just go to Laura Specter and say, "All right, Laura, do this." I'm going to say, "Laura, we got to know how much it's going to cost." I, I'm right up front with her. No BS. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with saying to an attorney, "We're not here to spend a ton of money. If you can't help us." In a short period of time, we're not going to do it because we can't afford to spend thousands of dollars doing this. But if you can come up with a quick language punch list, because she's, she's pretty good at that. She's, she's, she's not bad. I've sat with her, you've sat with her. I mean, she's a pretty astute gal. And I'd say if she can come up with language, maybe we can doctor it a little bit, but it'd be nice so we're not going to sit here and argue for four hours on where the and should go before the but or the the. Or, you know what I'm saying? We're on the same page with this, so we can go away from it now and go somewhere else. I, I'm hoping that we're doing some good here. I hope so. Yeah. I think so. And nobody here is, everybody's got the same idea. Less restrictive government, don't screw your neighbor, but don't get screwed yourself. Pretty much. I think it's a heck of a good philosophy anyway. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I'm on TV with all this. I'm <laughs> I, don't, I won't watch it anyway. Well, we covered half of it. <laughs> the number of persons engaged in the outside operation, or a combination like this, shall not be more than four, excluding the residents. That's my main. I got a big issue with that one. Yeah, the number of employees that like we discussed yep. before about. I yes. fought this one when they wrote it. Yeah, there was a reason why there was four. Was there? There was a specific state reason. No. They didn't want the business to be too big. Yep. That's I don't have a problem with four. Does it keep your business from getting too too large or limited down? Was that I wanted at any one time? Someone say that that was specific yeah. to um, paying taxes. No, no, no. Employment. The state requires. Okay. Regardless of the type of business that you own, whether it be a commercial home occupation, uh, whatever, when you hit a certain level of, of employees. You are required to start following certain federal and state laws regarding yep. employment. One of those is you have to form basically a safety committee. We call them a, a, an occupational hazard, whatever it is, a mitigation committee, whatever it is that we, we call them. And what those are are people who are made up of your employees that meet once a quarter and discuss safety issues, and you fill out forms and you have to send it to the state. And when you hit a certain number of employees, regardless if it's a home occupation or not, then you have to do it. So our, our zoning has nothing to do with that. Because to be honest, when this was put in, that wasn't even thought of now. Okay. The whole purpose behind this, and when we tried to address it at the last time, you brought people out of the woodwork about it, and, and what their concern was, it was to limit and control how big your business could become at your residence. They did not want people working around the clock. They did not want more than, uh, to be honest, they were very gracious about more than four people. Because we, we, we talked about six people being able to come to your residence. And and you were involved in that. Yeah, most, so most ordinances either don't allow home-based businesses or don't allow any employees that don't, you know, not people that non-residents, they don't allow anyone that's not a resident of the home to work at it. This is extremely permissive. This is this allows a lot of different kinds of businesses to happen. I think, my personal opinion on this is that, especially given the input that Clifton's mentioning, um, if we don't want this to get shouted down, we might want to not try to go more than four or remove the limit entirely. I think that if somebody had a, I don't know how many people are even operating at the level of four employees in a home-based business right now in town. 
I don't know enough people to know whether that's even come, coming close to it. Uh, if somebody did have a case that was going to be reasonable and they wanted six people, you go to the ZBA. And, and, this, you, this, and this does not affect tradespeople because your employees really don't work at your location. They work at so, jobs. So, okay, let me so, 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 something so, here, okay? I'm sorry, if, 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 just to Clifton's point, one of the things that I changed when I made the working document wording was to make it, to insert the words on site. So the, the original wording said, the number of persons engaged in any one or combination of customary home occupations shall not be more than four, excluding the occupants. And that would cover, if you're, if you're running your office for your construction company out of your home, and you, have, you, and, you have book, and you have your bookkeeping person coming or whatever, and maybe a couple of people answering the phones or whatever, and you have 20 guys working for you, you'd be in violation of the current zoning. Now, the, the, the rewording says that you only count the people that are on site, in which case those 20 guys that are out in the field working wouldn't be counted against your four. Okay, that's all pretty academic. What I'm saying is, yes, that's fine, I still would like to see at any one time in there. Cl Clifton's, Clifton mentioned before that the, the feedback from the public the last time I had a public hearing on this was. You'll notice that they, you, I, and I'm going to tell you straight up. You change this wording here, and you will kill this document. That's the one paragraph from both times that I have sat through this with the public in, in a public forum that was the strongest problem was changing that to more than four people. We, we tried to say more than four at, a per, per, at one time. We tried to say more than, you know, uh, you know, four, four per shift. And their whole problem was that they, that they did not want you to be able to do shift work of four people per shift. They did not want more than four, period. That was the, that's the golden number. They don't want to see more than four people on Okay, side. so we don't agree on this. Well, I'm just uh, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. What it's I feel on this one is, is irrelevant. I'm not going to do with you, Cliff. The public's going to do. And the public will kill this document if you try to go more than four people. Point well taken. Okay. What I'm trying to do here is get the stuff that we all think we can make work. Then we'll go get the language and make it work. That's, you know, trying to be productive as opposed to just bloviating forever and not getting anything done. That's right. I, I see the point. I remember it well because I was one of the at any one time people that thought that if you're baking cakes all day and you had three different people come in that night, so, or let's just say you had three people helping you during the day and three people helping you at night. What does it say? Employees here? Let me see. Volunteers are covered. Wait a minute. Not as many as those as you want, huh? Okay, the number of persons engaged. It doesn't have anything to do with employees at all. This is people engaged. That means if you and your daughter are making cakes and you hire two other people to make cakes, you got four people. And if you go on and start making cakes at night and it's you and your daughter and two different people come in to help you that night to make cakes that you sell, you're still good. You're not good. It says excluding the residents. It says excluding the residents. Oh, that's excluding the residents. Okay, so if you have four people making cakes with you, I'm sorry, excluding residents. All right. Yeah, so, so somebody who has a very large family, lots of kids. They're very okay. Yeah, you have any a And he's the ultimate book field survivalist. I understand that. <laughs> no, so, I mean, so I think that I, I rarely agree with Cliff. I couldn't agree more with him on this one. If we, if we mess with this one Leave it, it alone. In, any, in any significant way, How do you feel? It, it's going to get killed. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see anything restrictive on this that, that they can't live with. I, I'd leave it alone. And if you want to attack if you want to attack this one, attack it next year. I don't want to attack anything. Well I'm saying if you want to change that one, how do you guys year. feel? Or, or do it as a separate leave it alone. Or do it as a separate issue. Yeah. Leave it alone. On site we, next we, right, we okay. 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 So um, so just to be clear, this is a change from what our current zoning says, the on site. On so site it's it's it, it, but it, I don't think it's going to go against what people were upset about, or were getting ready to be upset about, right? Because the people that are, aren't on site are I'm irrelevant. No, they're, they're irrelevant, right? So. Look, look, Bill Gaber had 12 guys working for him, but he sent them out into the field when he had Fern, Fernbrook or whatever the heck he was. Right. The firm. And, and what the on site change does is it takes the, 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 the possibility of somebody 
enforcing for construction or tradespeople, saying that they can't have their home-based business because they actually have more than 12 employees. Even though they don't come to their site and they don't work within that location because they all go out to different job sites. Well, they showed up in the morning, though, and Bill sent them out on his assignments. Yeah, but they're not actually... They're not working there, working no. Working on site. They're nope, showing agreed. up in the office. That's different. Okay, let's move on. We are all on the same page where there's no more necessity. We're back. We're up to number seven. Home occupation or home-based business is an accessory use by residents of the property and shall be secondary to their residential use of the property. Primary owner, operator of any home occupation or home-based business shall be the property owner of record or lessee of the lot where the on-site operations of the home occupation or home-based business are conducted. In addition, this primary operator shall reside in the residence or accessory dwelling unit located on the lot where the on-site operations of this home occupation or home-based business are conducted. If no dwelling exists on that lot, this primary owner operator shall reside on and be a property owner of record or lessee of a lot abutting the lot where the on-site operations of the home occupation or home-based business are Conducted. We're going to have a discussion on this one, I can see. Mm -hmm. So there's there's two things sort of lumped in here. One is that it actually has to be home-based in the sense that your home is there. Yep. And the other is that addressing the issue of the fact that there's a lot of people in town that own uh, multiple, multiple lots. lots that sit next to each other, right? Effectively, they're one lot, but I mean, but they're actually on the tax map, they're multiple lots. They get multiple tax bills every year, but they're... You know, there's a house on one of them and some other, you know. The barn. I'm one of those people, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of them too. You know, I, I own a 76 acres and a 2 acres, right? I mean, it's, um, and I don't think, so my intent here was not to cause people to have to go and do lot line adjustments between their lots that they own simply because there's a spot that they wanted to do their business on, on their property that happened to not be the same lot as their house was on. We could punt on that because maybe it doesn't affect that many people and just it would certainly simplify the language if we didn't have to deal with that issue. Okay, Clifton. The language in there is not that bad with the exception of having to be contiguous to the lot where you reside. And I understand Rob's position, but that is very restrictive to a lot of landowners in the town of Brookfield. Because a lot of landowners in this town have land that aren't contiguous to their, their base home lot. I, I don't think that we should restrict that ability to have a business on a piece of property that somebody owns solely based because it's not contiguous. Okay. Now, hear me out. Let me right, finish. I've held, I've held my tongue quite, quite often. Um, I do think, though, that somebody who owns a lot from another town shouldn't be able to come in and do a business in the, uh, on an on a unattended lot. And I do believe that that business should be secondary to the primary uses of those lands. So we have two zones in this, we, we have two uses in the majority of our property, residential and agricultural. So if I have, again, I'm going to make this argument, if I have a 15 acre lot where I am raising crops, and I have a barn at the back of that that sits on two acres, and I want to make furniture in that barn, but I make more on my crops than I'm going to on my furniture, I should be allowed to make furniture in my barn. Okay, I get the point. <coughs> Let's not go there for just one moment. Let me ask a question here. When we put this before the town and the, the town meeting, are we going to place each and every one of these ordinance changes as an individual entity before the town or one document? I think that we should try to do sort of the basic rewrite of that section as one Warren article. Okay, then. Now, however, I would suggest that Clifton's change is, his suggested change is fairly radical and, right, and it's it, because it, it, well, hear, hear me out just for a second and I can be quick on this home based for most people means based at their home okay. now we can define words mean whatever we want I'm, so I'm not saying we can't do it I'm just saying that 
people will be surprised if they just read about, if they said, oh, we're going to be rewrite the, clarify the, the wording and maybe remove, remove some arbitrary restrictions on home-based businesses. And then all of a sudden, they re, you know, there's this place where there is no home that now is legally doing a business. Okay. So, so my suggestion would be, if you want to go forward with that, let's make it a separate Warren article. I so that people can decide on that one issue. That's where I was going, Rob, without 400 words. I was going to say, these should be individual because this, like the more than four, is a hill to die on. People are going to come out of the woodwork for that one too. And it may pass, and it may not, but don't kill the entire document based on that one article, because that's, that is, it, it's, if it, if it doesn't get changed, it stays exactly as it is. Not that it, it's that way now, this is rewrite by Rob anyway. And it won't, but it'll stay like it is in the ordinance, if they don't what, accept what, what it. What is the current ordinance uh, I can't read it to you. So it says customary home occupations. Which I think yeah. that if you, given no what no funky definition for home, I think the courts would uh, would would be very likely to find that the furniture business on a farm where there's no residence doesn't is not a home base, is not a customary home market. But, but if my residence is in the same town, it's still my property. That's a, that that's just irrelevant. I understand why you say that, but it's it, quite honestly, it's irrelevant. Well, whether it is or not, it's not a subject that we're going to decide. That the voters are going to decide it. And when we put this before the voters... No, no, Clifton's question was, what does the zoning say now? Oh, I'm trying to get there. It's page 253, top, right at the top. Yeah. Uh, page what? 253. 253. Owner of record manager, you must live in any truck and use a bed and breakfast. Now. Two of fifty-three at the top. I have a different version. March eighth, two thousand eleven. <clears throat> That's what I'm looking at. Is that, is that the current one? Oh no! This is a George update. Better be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that in 2 of 53. I've got the... Um, no, it's not 2010. Wait, what's the date of the bottom of your page? The other page is 2010. No, it's not in 2010. <laughs> You've got it. Oh, Carrie, see, I've got a wrong one here. I don't know why I've got that. I've got the wrong thing. Customer who I... Where's that? Yeah, I got March 9th. What the hell is that? 2010. You've got March 8th. What gives you? 2011. That? You're you're 2010. You're 11. Okay. So you're missing the changes we made related to defending yeah, I am missing culture. It. Yeah, okay. This really doesn't have similar wording to yours, really. No, but if you read the current zoning, it's the, the accessory use that's allowed is customary home occupations. And the a reasonable definition of home is where somebody lives, right? So this is a good accessory use to where somebody lives, a residential use. I, I, I've been reading, I don't know, I'm, I'm nutty, but I've been reading a whole bunch of Supreme Court cases from New Hampshire and stuff like that. It's pretty, there, there's at least a couple of them that are mentioned, interpretation of home-based stuff. And, and yeah, well, we can't get into forecasting court. No, I, I understand. I want to ask you a question. Sure. You, of everybody here, you feel that you should not be able to have a business on a separate lot. I don't care what your reasons are. Cliff feels that they, you should be able to have a business if you have a lot that's not contiguous. Jim, how do you feel? No. You should not. Steve? It's your property. You could do what you want. Ed? I think as long as you live in the town. Yes. Rick? A property 
that does not have your home on it doesn't have a home business on it. So no. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm the typewriter. Holy crap. Excuse me. <laughs> Actually, Gary, I don't think you're the typewriter. Because, no, we're not voting. Be, no, no, no. Because the split, I think that just wh whichever side I happen to be on, I don't care. The split in the fact that we, this cross section of the town, is so divided on that, that tells me let's let's make that particular question. If we want to ask the people, make that a, a separate zoning word article. That's okay. That's where I'm going, Ron. I got it. I got it figured out. I wanted to find out how many people felt strongly as a board. If we're going to do that, we make it a separate article. And because you feel one way, you feel a different way. We all we all feel certain. Way. Let's let's go get go after the language now. This is actually one way, and we're going to have to come up with a. We'll have to come up with a new language that allows you to do this. That's all, right? Take the word home. Well, I, yeah, I think you you basically you're defining a non home based business, a farm based, a agriculture based business, or something right. like that. I think somebody would have to sit down and think okay. about how to word that if the, if we want to propose that. I think it should be separate from this because okay. people are going to be. You don't want to surprise the voters. I mean, no, I agree. I agree. Well, you got uh, you got a couple of farms in the town. You got sugar bushes that are on those properties. Those are those are agricultural. I mean, those are agricultural. Okay, okay good. We actually got past that one. I'm amazed. Well, we could bag it for tonight as long as time as it. Eight forty-two. We get them. All right. Let's 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 call it quit. Number eight is signboard. We well, don't need a big discussion on that. That's not really we changing what's there. We need to touch on six. So I thought we could do that another time. Six. All my things only can remain limited in scope and be clearly incidental, secondary to the residential use of the property. That's a hard one to argue with, no matter how you look at it. Yeah. Well, we didn't no, touch on I, I think what I think what Jim was pointing out was the residential piece of that, right? Which gets to the yeah. point Clifton was making, mm -hmm. right? Clifton really would want to change six to get not say specifically residential. He'd say residential or agricultural. Right. Yeah, that's why I had the suggestion, but we didn't, we kind of skipped over that as we were going through it. Well, let's go back at it next time. Yeah. yeah. We so, did a lot here over this time. Yeah. We'll, we'll pick it up on six and seven. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Well, I think that if, you know, maybe Clifton, I don't know if you want to take it on, but I think that it would be interesting to see what kind of wording you uh, I will take it up. You know, for, for an agricultural Write business. it up. I will. All right. Can you can you do me a favor? If, you, if you're really idea. serious on doing it, write yeah. it up and get it to me. I, I had it to the board ten days prior to the get meeting it. in order for it to be considered and voted on at the meeting. I tell you why. I firmly believe that if we're going to do this and we're going to change language, we need external input professional because, and I don't think we got to spend much money doing it. But to achieve what we want to achieve and make it hold water. I think we need to do that. I think if we put what we what we're thinking down on paper and give that to Laura to look We've at, got a bunch of it done that, that would be a good yeah. idea. So Gary, I think there's two. I, I don't disagree with you. There's a couple options. One would be the attorney, which is going to be the most expensive per hour. Mm -hmm. um, there's also professional planners. Yeah. Um, when we were dealing with SB 342, the workforce housing, we used. Um, Somebody named Julie. I don't remember her last Where name. Where is she? Yeah, from SRPC. SRPC. So, I mean, so, I mean, and I think we paid her hourly, or maybe even, I think maybe the Martins paid for her. Just, uh, you know, they donated that her to us. So. They did, but, because Ann Martin was trying to get her point across. <laughs> I know why they brought her in. But, uh, but well, there's LGC, too, you know. Yeah, but I'll, I worked with her on, on the wording, it. And, it, and it was actually helpful. They had to be careful of the hidden meaning of, I, you know, actually I do the research on the wording that came out to make sure that it, I understood what it, the implications were of those particular phrases. So I mean, you got to be careful with who, anyone who does the wording. You got to be careful, make sure it really means Especially when you're dealing with regional planners. Mm -hmm. Well. Anyway, okay. I think Laura, Laura, I mean, she, if we, if it's not going to be too expensive, I I'm going to ask you that. Number one, I'm going to say, how much money is this going to cost us if we have a limited budget? Not, no BS. I mean, she, I have no problem asking that. Not at all. And Laura only has one agenda. The tax. 
Yeah. Yeah, I like her. She's a, she's a smart lady. I never felt I was dealing with uh, less than that. Uh, smarter than I am, so anyway. Um, where's my agenda? We're going to finish this up. Come on, agenda. We moved it all over the place here. Yeah, good deal. New business. We're on. We'll review. Is there any new business that anyone would like to bring up? Ed? I do have something to bring up. It should be really quick. On June 25th, we had a presentation of the opposing view of the Granite State Future Agreement. Well, I was handed this box at the SRPC meeting to issue it to the town. Now, I didn't want to put it up until everybody looked at it. This is called a, the Grand State Future. It's a listening station. They call it a listening station. And basically, uh, somebody from the area, from the town, will come and they'll, they'll read their little uh, blurb here of what the Grand State Future is in their terms. And then they're supposed to fill out this little card, which, which uh, basically says, what is best about this area? You're supposed to fill it out. You either live or work or just visit. You're a seasonal resident. Uh, and then what could be done to make this area even better, and you're supposed to fill it out. And if you want to know more about the Grand State Future uh, Agreement, then you just click yes or no, and you can add your name and email. I just wanted to make people aware that they're here, so you could actually, if you want, I have to get more cards, but you can actually look at this. This is definitely affects all of us. And you can fill it out, stick it in the box. I did. Now this leads me to explain what happened at the SRPC meeting just recently. Our board sent a letter to the executive director, Cynthia Copeland, asking her to reschedule for our, their presentation about the Grand State Future Agreement since we had some questions for her. Uh, she is going to return that letter to us, and I'm assuming, assuming is the word, that we are going to be sent someone. I asked for the HUD representative of New Hampshire to come here and explain it because he very adequately explained it to the Rochester City Council. And it would answer all our questions. But this is here. I just need to know what to do with this. I didn't want to, by myself, just go and place this in the townhouse because we are not signed up for this. So it's really up to us where to put it. Well, this is really innocuous, innocuously written. It's like really innocuous. And if, and if anybody wants some good reading, I would suggest getting last week's uh, Daily Foster's um, Democrat and reading the um, letters to the editors. All week last week, almost every day, there were letters in there about the Granite State future and Agenda 21. Um, so it was just some good reading. Mostly supporting or against? Um, or both? Very opinionated both ways. Uh -huh. um, there were rebuttals of letters to rebuttals to rebuttals of the letters. Uh -huh. It was a very good conversation and, and um, you know, you, you couldn't wait to get to the next day to read what was being said. And the main question people have is, well, let's just say a town person comes in and fills this out and sticks it in that box. Where does it go? What happens to it? Well, this will go to the Regional Planning Commission and it will work with the, if you signed on to it, it will work to help with the regional plans, the master plans that the RPC works on, on the local level. If you sign on to this, you've also signed that agreement with HUD, which also forms the, the equity teams. Yeah. which make up the disadvantaged populations. That's still, this, still, this is the reason why we, need, we wanted a presentation here by HUD so they can answer some of these questions, like how do they pick the regional equity teams? How are they going to affect local planning? How does all <coughs> So hopefully this will happen at some point. But this is where the part will go, and this is how it's used. So. Well, I so, think, and, and, and I can't tell <coughs> the other two selectmen, but he has a selectman, I would say that I would not be comfortable putting that box out until they have come here and made their presentation. I agree, that's, that's what I think. Yes. What, what's our criteria for the material that goes on the table in the offices next door? It has to be approved by the select board. Yeah. What, what criteria do you apply? 
It has to relate to the town. Okay, so it doesn't, but it doesn't matter who's, just any... We any don't allow commercial advertising. Okay. We don't allow um, solicitations mm -hmm. uh, in regards to for sales, you know, private entities, private businesses. This would fall under planning because it is gathering out information. We did allow the information for the bus program to be put out, even Co though that Coast. is a uh, private entity that, that charges fees to do that, but it is a benefit to our elderly residents. So this is the kind of thing that if it were relevant to us, but we would allow you to uh, okay. uh, can, I, can I ask who pays for this? Who's paying for producing the boxes, distributing them, uh, taking the, the taking them taking these cards and doing something with them. To do the federal grant. The, the federal grants. The federal grant is between Nashua, the National Regional Planning Commission. They're the hub. They're the ones that signed the agreement. They're the ones that went out and the towns to ask for letters of support, not agreement signing, but just letters of support. When they accomplished getting enough of them, the federal government stepped in and said, "Okay, you now have enough that you will we can start the process going." So Nashua then got some money just to start this process. Now I videotaped a, um, a training session of the people who manufactured this. That place is called Action Media. Now if you go to the website actionmedia.org, you can see what type of organization it is and what it does. Uh, it's, it's, uh, one of its main tenets was to, um, it sounded like, to extinguish the opposition. So if you are an entity that wants to uh, accomplish something, you hire them and they help you Extinct. diminish the opposition of it. Right. Now, try to follow the money trail. Like, so this obviously costs some money. I'm a taxpayer. I paid for this. Yeah, if, I, if I wanted to give feedback on whether I think this is a good idea or a bad idea to my closest elected representative, that I elected or had, had either voted for or against to spend this money this way, who would that be? <coughs> it's not a selectman. I, I know it you guys be, didn't do this. It would be your state. You would be your state congressman, uh, or your, your, right. your congressman, congressman, or your senator at, at the federal level. At the federal level. So this is this is not local. There's nothing local about this. It sounds like at least how this is being no, funded. Oh, no, but if it comes from the federal government. But at least your money went to pay for a company that's trying to shut you up about your opposition to it. Uh, I didn't say I was opposed. So just a if bit. You of, were, so just a bit of feedback on this. I don't understand reading these two questions. You read a, you read the card. I do not understand what actionable anything comes from these questions. This is, there's there's no scientific. Anything you could do with this, it's voluntary, which means your people that are extreme one way or another are going to answer this. People that are sort of in the middle, the vast majority, aren't going to answer this. And, I mean, what are you going to do with, you know, what could make this be the area even better? What the heck do you do with that? This is a complete waste of money. It's a gateway. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm it's saying there, there, is, there is no... The government doesn't waste there, money. It's, it's a there, there is no good that can come of this other than somebody who has a job. Collecting these, collating these, or whatever. Uh, other than them getting your information, so they can contact you with their proper data. No, actually, <laughs> what it does, what that card is asking, is to give a representation of the the attitude of a, of an area in regards to a, this kind of idea. But it's, it's going to be it, it's inherently biased because. Ed, he, he, he could present it one way or another. He could, he could only have his friends put in cards or only his enemies put in cards don't or whatever, think, right? I mean, this don't is, you think that is, this is commensurate with the slow indoctrination of society that we watch every day, all day? Subtle, slow indoctrination of our children? Nudge. That's the way it is. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand why this, this, this data is not actionable and they might as well just make it up to say whatever they want because it's not actionable. Yeah, they That's what they already did. Non-reality facing, feel-good people will they got the cards they don't like throwing <laughs> Okay, are we finished with this? Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed still wants to talk. Good, go ahead. Let's actually get facts. This is actionable once you sign on to the grant with the federal government. 144, 1044. Yes, once you sign on to it, this information will be because you agree to it. It, could, it can be used. 
So they're going to take this data and actually take action and use this data as the, the reasoning behind the action they decided to take? Correct. What is best about this area? One, it will be one avenue. I suggest that we wait for the HUD representative to show up to ask him these questions. Recently, Rochester, I you take that meeting to Rochester, Rochester City Hall Council voted eight to four to not adopt the Granite State Future. Yeah. Also, the federal at the federal level called the Sustainable Communities Initiative. <coughs> Before, Mr. Selectman, you said that this is related to Agenda 21. To be more accurate, Agenda 21 does not exist in the United States. It could not exist. It only exists in principle of what the federal government did by agreeing to certain things with the United Nations. So technically, we cannot say it's Agenda 21. This is federal mandates. I, I did not say that that was specifically related to Agenda 21. What I said was there was some interesting reading in the, in the Daily Foster's Democrat that discussed the Granite State future and Agenda 21. Usually when somebody starts mentioning Agenda 21, it sounds like it's something from far away, but it's in fact our own government that's, that's doing this, and people are starting to, you know, breed into it. But it's very important we get HUD here to, to answer the questions, because our question was, what regional impact does it have if Wolfboro signs on, and Milton or Farmington signs on, what does that mean to us? Sure. That's the question we would like to ask, answer. So I just wonder what I should do with this. Hang on to it until they show up and do the presentation. Well, they're expecting it that it not be in my truck anymore and that it should be out in the townhouse. We have an act on Leave it in your barn. <laughs> <laughs> why, don't you, why, don't you, why don't you put it in front? Why don't you put it in front of the planning board uh, slot right. in, in the um, in our office over there? I want to put it in the selectman's office until after they until we've that, gotten our address. Well, I, personally, I think it's chilly. You can store it safely in the fireplace. All right, Ed, are you finished? That's my personal opinion. That was very good. Absolutely. Thank you. Ed, would you like a motion? To that, the motion? You can't display it anyway. No, we can't display it. It hasn't, hasn't been approved okay. yet. Okay. Did Any other you? member comments tonight? Did you fill out your card? No. If you didn't fill it out, you are a resident. You can fill this out and then stick it in that box. I don't want to fill it out. Why would I want to do that? Oh, that means I'm cooperating in some fashion with this whole thing. That's right. I don't really want to cooperate. Okay. We are now. Anybody else? Sorry, uh, member, member comments now? Oh, yeah, member comments. We're adjourned then. Thank you and good night. Good. All right, member comments. Who said this? Is it good reading? Oh, yeah. <laughs>